Billy Bob. It's so nice to have you here, Bill. Uh, nice to see you, Sigrid. We, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about your personal history and behavior analysis and your recollections of the overall history. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first thing I'd like to know is how did you become a behavior analyst? Uh, yeah, well, it's a kind of an interesting story in a way. Uh, I, when I entered Harvard, uh, I was uh, interested in animal behavior. And the truth is that actually I was interested in animals from the time I was a little kid. Uh, and by the time I got to high school I was already you know, studying white mice and did a project and so on. So, so I, I knew I wanted to study animal behavior, but I thought the biology department, you know? So I was intending to concentrate in biology. and. Uh, and then what happened was, uh, in the spring of my freshman year, I was flipping through the course catalog and I noticed Matsai 114. And uh, so I uh, went to that and it seemed interesting. This guy Skinner was the lecturer. And, uh, and so I, I, I took the course. And as a matter of fact, um, I think it was the first time they were using teaching machines. Those those old teaching machines, you know, the mechanical ones. And I and they split the course in half. The students, uh, uh, half of the students were do, just doing the regular way, and half of them were uh, using the teaching machines. And and I was in the group with the teaching machines. So. Uh, I found that really great. I mean, you know, I could go at my own pace, and uh, and it was uh, it was really uh, quite nice. So I liked that course, and um, and then I thought, well, let's see what else there is in the psychology department. I I, I had thought psychology, no, you know, fat, but uh, uh, I didn't have to see, I didn't have to take you know, ordinary introductory psychology or in fact any of the things because they were all over in social relations, the other department. And so I took a course from a guy named Hernstein in my sophomore year. And uh, <laughs> we, we got along, I guess you could say. Uh, and so when I went to see him one time, he said, uh, he said, well, well, you know, what are you planning to concentrate in? I, you know, I said, well, biology, you know, and he said, uh, well, you know, in biology, they have lots of requirements, course requirements, whereas if you concentrate in psychology, all you have to do is take six courses. It's, uh, then you'll have plenty of other courses left over you can take, you know, <laughs> and that's how it was that he persuaded me to concentrate in psychology. And then, of course, from there on out, I mean, Hernstein and I had a good relationship, and, uh, and I did a you know, senior honors thesis uh, and, uh, on uh, choice in the RAD, uh, an analog. He, he suggested, I, I try this, uh, an analog of a T maze. So I built a chamber with three levers, you know, and, uh, and Dick was a sort of hands off kind of. Uh, supervisor, he, he, he you know, in those days, you know, we were using relays and electromechanical equipment. So, you know, he puts me in with a, a, a relay rack and he, he shows me if you operate this, you know, the relays will switch. And he says, now learn. <laughs> so, it was challenging and it was good and I, uh, I, felt like, okay, I can study animal behavior this way. And uh, then uh, I took a year off and, uh, and I decided to go back to graduate school. So, uh, so I went there and really that's when I became a behavior analyst, this was a graduate school. So why did you go back there? Just because that's what you knew? And it was local or <laughs> well yeah it was sort of like that well the truth is that that when I graduated from college I wasn't entirely sure that I wanted to pursue any kind of academic career uh, my father was an artist 
a painter. And so I was really drawn to, to art. And uh, so I wanted to try out being an artist, actually. And, that, uh, and I did. I, uh, I was painting. I went to art school. So that was your dark uh, year. <laughs> well, it, I mean, it's what Skinner it was, called his dark year. It know? was a, in a way, it was a very good year because uh, about about halfway through, I decided uh, that art was not going to be for me because uh, although I had talent, I knew I didn't have enough talent to make it as an artist because it's a very tough life, and uh, and my father was very much opposed to my being an artist and he also was pressuring me and uh, so I thought well you know actually I was pretty good at that so maybe I'll be a scientist and I went back to graduate school I applied and uh, when you know was accepted and, uh, yeah so I hit the ground running you could say uh, you were fortunate to have those early contacts to Ah, you know what was really fortunate? It, it was it was the fall of 1962, and there was an unusually large uh, class of the of graduate students. There were oh, I, it must have been about 18 they took in, which was like at least twice the normal, and uh, and a lot of them actually wound up going into behavior analysis. There were, there weren't that many choices. Uh, we were in Memorial Hall, the basement of Memorial Hall. And down one end was uh, Smitty Stevens and psychophysics, and down the other end was uh, Skinner and Hernstein and the animal lab. And uh, so you, you basically graduated to, uh, gra gravitated to one or the other of those, although the Center for Cognitive Studies opened up around then too. And uh, so, uh, a lot of the students actually wound up in that animal lab, and, and there are people who you may have heard of, like uh, Phil Heinlein and <laughs> Howie Racklin and Al Nuringer, you know. I think I heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was an interesting cohort, and, and in the year before us, John Stadden and Ed Fantino were it was quite a run in those years, wasn't it? It was maybe several years where there were people that became very well-known behavior analysts. Well, you know, uh, Hernstein was running the pigeon lab at that time, and uh, the pigeon lab under Hernstein was very active. Uh, you know, he was he was very permissive. I was running. I don't gee, I don't know how many experiments. I, uh, once I got started getting going, uh, there were there were well over. 50 relay rack stations, you know, and, uh, and chambers. So, so we had, you know, plenty of resources, and uh, uh, yeah, we we were dreaming up experiments and starting them up, you know, and it was uh, it was very lively. And we and once a week, the uh, the uh, pigeon group would meet, you know. And, Someone would talk about what they were doing, and sometimes it would be Dick, and sometimes uh, any one of us, more or less equally. <coughs> uh, you, that leads me to wonder how, what your sense at that time as a graduate student at Harvard doing behavior analysis, uh, how did the field look to you at that time? I mean, this was not long after JAB. Uh, mm. Began and did, did you guys have any sense of the larger perspective, or were you pretty much Bostonish? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> it was a you know you had the sense that there were sort of islands. Um, so you knew that there were some people at Columbia, you know, things like like that. Um, but at that time, we really didn't think about behavior analysis as separate from psychology. It was just sort of, you know, this was the behavioral approach within psychology and um, it, it, it wasn't big, you know, it, it, was, it was sort of, it wasn't really very well differentiated from experimental psychology in general. And um, so uh, it, we didn't have that, that identity that we would have now, and um, 
And not everyone was interested in the philosophy. Mm -hmm. But as it happens, Dick was interested in both the philosophy and the uh, research. So um, we studied history quite a bit. And then I remember one semester, Al Nuringer and I, just the two of us, had a seminar with, uh, with Dick Hernstein on uh, philosophy. And that was great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I gradually became interested in the philosophical aspects of it, too. And uh, so, well, Do you yeah. remember some of the works that you read in that uh, small seminar? Yeah, yeah, we, um, I remember reading Schopenhauer. That was, that was quite interesting, the, you know, the world is will and idea. And, uh, uh, let's see, what else? Um, I'm pretty sure we read some, uh, William James, um, but, uh, oh yeah, and Kant, we, you know, uh, we started off with, you know, the fairly, the, the European mm -hmm. philosophers, uh, but I don't remember all of them. Not back to yeah. the Greeks, though. Uh, oh, good question. I don't think so. I, yeah, it would have been great if we had read some Aristotle mm -hmm. in, in retrospect, I, but I don't think we did. Mm -hmm. I think it was mostly, we started with the 19th century Europeans. Philosophy is interesting. Uh, when people teach it, they, there's such a huge range of possibilities, and so you really learn a lot about the teacher by what choices they make as, as yeah. far as the philosophers that they have you read. Right, <laughs> so. right. Yeah, although because it was just the three of us, we, we generally uh, d discussed it each week among the three of us to decide what we'd read, yeah. and then uh, then we'd frame questions for one another. The, the, bef the day before we would meet, uh, we would circulate these, uh, these questions that uh, uh, we had as a uh, result of our reading. Sounds like wonderful fun. Yeah, it was, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, this, uh, how did you, let me ask you first of all, what, do you, what would you like people to remember you, your, you for in your work? What, what work would you like to be remembered for? Okay. Yeah, hundred years. After from I that. shuffle off this mortal. Way coin. after you shuffle off, <laughs> unless you get the unless you get the fountain of youth. <laughs> right. Well, gee, that's a actually that's a very hard question to answer because, uh, you know, I have split my time fairly evenly between uh, experimental work and. Uh, the philosophical work, and I, I found them both fascinating. Uh, I, I feel as though I've made contributions in both areas. Uh, uh, I, I got more and more interested in the philosophy of behaviorism, and um, and you know, and started writing about that. But you know, that's it's in some ways harder, actually, than the experimental work. Uh, I, I think the, the, the one um, concept that actually uh, draws both together, uh, both lines of work, is the concept uh, of the molar paradigm for behavior. Um, I have uh, convinced myself that this has got to be the way of the future. And, uh, and, you know, so I write about it in, in both contexts, mm -hmm. really. Uh, so I guess if, if I, uh, this is not a question I would normally ask myself, this, you know, what will right. I be remembered for? <laughs> uh, but I suppose it would be that. I, I mean, I, uh, I think it, it, it should be uh, the paradigm for the future of behavior analysis because it's it's so applicable both to the laboratory work and to uh, practical settings and so and it kind of integrates the whole big picture in the theory yes. of the philosophical that's, experimental applied that's what i think i, th I think yeah it, it unites both the 
the way that I've uh, done these experiments, particularly the more recent ones uh, with Michael Davison studying dynamics of choice, and uh, and talking about everyday life as I did in my book on understanding behaviors. Mm -hmm. How do you think behavior analysis has changed during the course of your career? Let's say beginning with graduate school up until now. Yeah, well, it's changed a lot. I mean, when I was in graduate school, uh, JAB was only a few years old, you know, and. Uh, so the whole the whole field. Well, first of all, it's grown, uh, and uh, and I see now, like you know, I call, people ask me, "What do you do?" I you know, I, I say I'm a behavior analyst, and by golly, a lot of them know what that is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, <That's amazing. laughs> yeah, right. Whereas years ago, if I said I'm a behavior analyst, people would say, "What's that?" You know, uh, so. So the, the, the field has achieved an identity. It's got a long way to go, I think, probably. But, uh, you know, uh, um, it, it's spread and keeps on cropping up in different places. Even when, it, well, even when it sort of disappears in one place, it pops up somewhere else, you know. And Were you at the Behavioral Economics Conference this year? No, I didn't go to that. It's very interesting because that work is going into, you know, helping the real world, dealing with the real world. I mean, there's so many areas that starts out just purely experimental, and yeah. pretty soon people are making use of them. Right. Well, the economists have gotten interested in behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a fairly recent development, actually. But I think uh, Einstein had anything to do with that? Uh, you know, I, I doubt it, actually. Um, I think that that Howie Racklin and Len Green had a lot to do with it, though, because they were they were both interested in uh, doing experiments in economics, and they teamed up with a couple of economists, mm -hmm. and so I I think uh, well, not don't know the exact history here, but I'm pretty sure that was how the field of behavioral economics was born, mm -hmm. although economists tend only to, uh, you know, cite themselves. They, they rarely cite anyone outside of economics. So do behavior analysts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the economists are worse. Uh, they're even worse than we are. <laughs> oh, much worse, yeah. There's a kind of, there's almost an attitude there, you know, where we're better than everybody else. And uh, so I'm hoping that a conference like that one in Chicago would, would actually bring behavior analysis to the attention of the economists. I think that was perhaps one of its yeah, yeah. reasons Gold. for existence. Because yeah, right. <laughs> right. they did have some people there from different fields. It was, it was a very yeah. interesting conference. I, mm. attended. I enjoyed it very much. Um, this is a question that you probably have thought about a little bit. Is if you had to do it over again, is there anything that you would do differently in your career? Well, that's like asking if I had my life to live over again. And you know, everything that has happened to me was just a, a valuable part of my life. The, 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 uh, that's my uh, feeling about it. I, uh, uh, so, uh, like the poet Rumi that says, you know, to every experience that I've had in my life, I would bow down. And uh, <laughs> so that's kind of the way I feel about that. I, you know, God knows my life would go, have gone very differently if I'd stayed in biology. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I loved the, doing the research, and that was the big draw. Well, you've given us a lot to think about in behavior analysis. We well, appreciate that. I, I certainly I want to. I hope so. <laughs> uh, I know I know you're not entirely convinced about this molar power. No, I, but, I, uh, uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't see it. I personally don't really see that it's such a... Uh, I think there's ways of putting it together. 
So I think motors valid, valid, and I think molecular is valid. And it's just sort of I like to put everything together. <laughs> so, it's not either or, but both and. <laughs> so, All right. Well. So I'm I'm cool with motor. I, I love what you guys are doing. All right. Uh, what areas of the field would you like to see more work in? Well, that's a hard question to answer. I, you know, I see the field uh, expanding, and uh, you know, the I can see the you know the the, the clinical and uh, applied uh, side are growing by leaps and bounds. I hope that they don't lose sight of the basic research, uh, although you know that's certainly a possibility. Uh, so, being a basic researcher myself, I'm, uh, I'm mostly concerned that that should continue. Um, but what I would like to see, and I, I don't know that this is, will ever happen, but I would like to see behavior analysis uh, link up with evolutionary biology. I think uh, that being outside of the evolutionary paradigm is is hurtful for the field. Uh, it's that's the the the, the great um, what should we say conceptual framework uh, for for all the life sciences now, and 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 I think it's unfortunate that uh, behavior analysts mostly are, are pretty ignorant of evolutionary theory. So um, that's that's what I would like to see. Uh, but you know, I, I don't I don't not at all optimistic about it. Well, I think you've been working toward that in your own work, or you've been offering some. Um, well, I know you have. You've been offering some avenues to explore in that area. Just yeah, I've been trying, and uh, and I'm continuing to, and uh, so uh, I've 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 been. As, uh, as part of developing in this way toward uh, evolutionary biology and, the, and this molar paradigm, uh, I have come to some uh, criticisms of the concept of reinforcement. And, uh, and I've been writing about that and talking about it. And, uh, you know, I've heard some of those this, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very challenging. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't expect to make any friends, but, uh, you know, this, I, uh, there's a paper in the works that um, uh, I think will eventually see the light of day in JF, and uh, we'll see what happens. Sort of think into the future, maybe 50, 60, 100 years, and what do you see the future? I guess I could put this in two ways. One is, how do, how do you think the future will play out? Or perhaps, how do you hope that the future plays out? Is there any distinction between how you think it will and how you hope it will? No, actually, I, I feel like there's a process of cultural selection that will, if, if behavior analysis as a field has something really to offer will kick in and, uh, and we will see behavior analysis become uh, even more of a phenomenon and, uh, and in what we might call the marketplace of ideas it should succeed if there's anything to it. I mean if it's, if it's valid it, it should succeed. And I expect it to succeed, actually. Uh, I, I, its its message is very countercultural, but uh, but I think you know people find ways to sort of uh, get, get close to it without fully uh, accepting all of the premises, like you know determinism, you know, uh, so on. But uh, you know. The absence of agency; those are very strong, very well cherished 
ideas within our culture, but uh, well, you know, people can see that it, that it often works, like you know, with autism, I gather behavior and analytic techniques are the only ones that really work, and that. You know, that's probably very uh, influential. Um, but, on the other hand, I also think that uh, the, the philosophy that underlies behavior analysis uh, should, I, I'll say, I hope, uh, should gain ground in our culture. And, uh, and if it does, you know, like in, in my book, I, I write that uh, Really, if you examine what behavior analysis means for, in a practical sense for our society, uh, it, it comes down on the side of compassion and, uh, and nice things, you know. It's absolutely true. <laughs> I had another question I wanted to ask you. The uh, biological sciences, and particularly evolutionary theory, has now generated over the past, let's say, 40 to 50 years, a uh, very large number of philosophers of biology. Yeah. Uh, up until the 70s, perhaps, philosophers took physics as their paradigm science. And then some philosophers started, Michael Ruse, David Hull, uh, started taking biology as the the science that they use to try to understand our philosophy of science. Yes. Uh, do you, I, I've thought for a long time that behavior analysis really needs this type of, of work. Yes. Uh, not everybody agreeing with each other, but a number of people working out these tr things, trying to solve some of these, what I consider serious conceptual problems with the field. I mean, I know mm -hmm. you, you see that too. There may be yeah. different problems that we see, but I think we yeah. both see that there are some serious problems with our language, with, with, uh, and so that's what philosophers of science do. They point to the science and say, hey, you know, right. there's a problem here with your concept, you know, it's not really yeah. working. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and do you think that, uh, that there's a chance that that will, uh, that will emerge now? Like David Hall pointed out that in biology, yeah. the, those people come from two, uh, two sources. One are uh, philosophically trained people people who get degrees in philosophy and take yeah. biology. And then you have the people who are scientists or other people in fields to start with, and then they start from their scientific yeah. framework and go to the philosophy, but they work together. Yeah. And, and it, by work together, I mean they read each other and converse with each other in the literature. Yeah. Do you see any chance that this will happen in behavior analysis? And do you think it's a good idea? Well. I think it's a good idea. Whether it will happen or not is a little hard to predict. Um, but yeah, I, I'm in that sort of second group where I started as a scientist and then got interested in the philosophy, and uh, and and sort of serendipitously, if there's a word like that, uh, it turns out that the Davis. Uh, philosophy department is very strong in philosophy of biology, and uh, and I've been hanging out with these philosophers of biology now quite a bit. Uh, well, Mike Gieslin, who I think you may oh, know, Mike wonderful thinker. <laughs> yeah, he is. He, he's a great fellow, and uh, and a guy named Jim Griesemer, who's uh, a professor in the philosophy department at Davis. Uh, UC Davis, and um, <clears throat> and they they're just both of those people are they're very stimulating to talk to, and so of course I talk to them about the concepts that uh, I'm working on in, in uh, trying to develop a, this new paradigm for behavior analysis, and linking that to evolutionary biology. So. Um, I think I actually have persuaded Mike Giesler now. Uh, Congratulations. Uh, he, uh, he, 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 he very much seems to appreciate the approach. And he's, so um, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun, actually. Yeah. That's great. Billy, 
If you were to send a message to students of the future, both the immediate future and the distant future, what do you what do you want, what would you like to tell them? What is your advice to the students? Well, first off, in a general way, uh, I give the same advice to everyone. I, because it was the advice that I got at the student orientation at the beginning of my freshman year in college. I don't even remember anymore who this person was. A guy got up and he spoke, you know, to the freshman class. And he said this one thing. He said, follow your interests. Don't you know, don't do things for extraneous reasons. In, in choosing your courses, follow your interests. And, and that's been my counsel to my students and to my children. Uh, don't, don't let mundane considerations interfere with your growth. So, so my, you know, my general advice is always that, follow your interests. Uh, now, uh, maybe you want me to say something more specific, I don't know, but uh, uh, I guess my, if I was speaking particularly to some graduate students in behavior analysis, let's say, uh, you know, I, I guess I, I, I would want them to be aware of the philosophical issues uh, underlying what they're doing and not just to confine themselves to uh, the experimental work or the practical apl or applied work uh, to really know what the uh, philosophical issues are because our field is so radical, it is so countercultural. Uh, you should know something about that. And that would be my advice, because you'll you will come up against people, you know, who will challenge you. Uh, I remember one time I was giving a talk at uh, the University of New Hampshire to a group of, of scientists from other disciplines. You know, we we had a uh, sort of a I don't know what you call it, sem seminar a group that met, and so I was talking about behavior analysis. Well, I started off and hit uh, within you know very short time. I hit the uh, subject of free will. We never got beyond that. Yeah, you know, I never even got to talk about anything else because that was the hot button topic, you know. Uh, and and these people and all these other scientific disciplines just couldn't accept the idea that you know you, you might do without free will. So it's so it's good, I would say, for students, and I would counsel them to know how to deal with that kind of thing when you know when when a philosophical uh, issue like that comes up to be able to respond to it. That's great advice, and both of them. Your first one is exactly what I tell students. I say, you know, just don't make your decisions based on where the job is, or how much money the job pays, or what school is closest to your house, or. Yeah. Um, but do what you believe in and want to do, and you're interested in. I think it's interesting. Almost several people that I've interviewed have said that same thing. Yeah. Successful people. It's it's it yeah. seems obvious, and yet very seldom it seems like people get that advice. Yeah. They say, you know, if you do what you really are interested in, you will do well and the rest of it will follow. Yeah, yeah, just uh, not to worry, just go, go ahead, you know, and uh, however it turns out, we'll be okay. Uh, yeah, I, my, my parents were not interested in material things and, uh, you know, my father, really hated money and uh, and so he kind of instilled that in me uh, you know not to not to go after being wealthy or you know making a lot of money but, you know to think about uh, uh, developing uh, 
he, he had a, he had a, a favorite saying that he would say to me, develop your resources and, uh, you know, use what you got you know, and follow your interests. That's great. Thank you so much, Billy. This has been really interesting for me. I, think uh, I really appreciate you taking time to talk about <laughs> all of this. Thank you. I'm happy to do it.